Okay, well, perfect. Yeah, thank you very much for the introduction. And hello from my side as well. And I'm very happy to today talk about yeah how to build uh, Java applications with Quarkus and of course using Neo4j as a graph database and using the Quarkus Neo4j OGM way to map well to map our domain entities and to use that in our code. So this is about the topic that we have today. And about myself, just very, very briefly here, my name and some Java titles, as you can see. So I work a lot with Java. I'm a self-employed consultant. I help uh, companies and developers how to get better at what they're doing. And also I do a lot of things with enterprise software just in general, usually using Java and using all sorts of technologies, also graph databases. And this is what I want to show you today, especially how to do well, Quarkus applications together with Neo4j. And I think live coding or showing code is the most interesting. So actually all what we're gonna spend our time on in the session is about live coding and well, live demoing what we have. So I'm a person, I like coffee here. It's my favorite filter coffee at home. And that's why I will show you some example about what I call uh, favorite coffee. This is a code example that of course is available on GitHub. So you can check this out yourself. And in this example, I have some domain, well, some domain that I want to uh, show you that is based on coffee and, you know, like coffee beans and some tastes and flavors. And that especially shows where a graph database can shine. But well, since you attend this co uh, conference, I think you have at least some understanding probably a much better understanding that I have uh, about graph databases. But for those of you who are mostly working just in the enterprise space or where you say, well, I might not be that familiar with uh, graph databases, this might also be helpful, this session. Um, for all uh, everybody else, well, let's have a look how to use uh, Neo4j together with Quarkus and um, especially the Java OGM way. So if you don't know about Quarkus, Quarkus is a very interesting way how to uh, write um, modern enterprise applications. If you go to the website, quarkus.io, it says something about supersonic subatomic Java and also about something about native, um, native builds and things like this. But just in general, the way how Quarkus is engineered is a very interesting way to say, well, uh, what can we do here in terms of making our applications more efficient and also more well, productive to develop. So this is very interesting, the developer experience that we have in Quarkus. Uh, what this means is as follows. Well, if I go here and go and build my application with Maven, so I say something like Maven package, then what you see typically in the Quarkus world is that we have some Quarkus plugin that says something like Quarkus augment, uh, augmentation completed. So if you're wondering what that is or how Quarkus works, it works basically as follows that we say all of this, well, checking of our code, all of this building up of our meter model and using these annotations that we put in our code, it's very similar if you use Spring, um, needs to be done at some point, typically at runtime, right? That means you start up your application, you can be a Spring application, you can be using any Java EE application server, and then what the application or the framework is doing, it, it starts searching, right? For your meta models, for your annotations, and for injection, and then tries to resolve all of this. The difference in Quarkus is all of this here will be done at build time, like in your Maven build. That means the resulting Java application is, well, a standalone jar file, but is already highly optimized and only contains the code without any reflection, without any inversion of control, without any magic that simply can run. And for that reason, it runs really, really quickly. So on the target Quarkus app, it will create some Quarkus run jar that if we start this up, it starts up your application really, really quickly. Like here, that's 0.5 uh, seconds. And it's only that slow, quote unquote, because I include some persistence here. If you have a hello world, then it's even faster. But anyway, this is really fast compared to usually, you know, seconds and minutes of startup time. And then we can use, well, our code. Okay, so that's just about Quarkus and there are interesting guides uh, out there. And I also, well, have some courses on this topic if you want to learn more about Quarkus. But now we want to see especially, well, how to include this with a graph database with Neo4j. Quarkus comes with a lot of these dependencies and Quarkus modules. So it works a little bit like in the uh, spring world. 
And there's also, of course, a module for Quarkus and Neo4j. That means there is a way to automatically configure a Neo4j database. So this is a little bit small, but it just, you know, for you to show that there's a, a quirky worse, how this is called, um, an extension for that. And how this works is as follows, that we have an extension that just can be configured for our database. How does this work in our code? Well, we would need a dependency like Quarkus, and that has Quarkus Neo4j. I could include this directly. We have this indirectly here, which I will show in a second why that is the case. So I have it as a transitive dependency, but it's basically uh, this one, Quarkus Neo4j. And that will make sure that our Quarkus, um, uh, sorry, that our Neo4j Java driver is auto configured from these properties and then also would be available that is injectable in our application. So that means if I go to the application properties, I could go and configure it. You can check this out in the documentation, how to configure this. this. Well, typically, you know, we have an URI, username, password. This is now a local example where I run my database, my Neo4j database in a local Docker container. Of course, you could use any other approach as well. For example, you can have a uh, cloud-based hosted version with Neo4j Aura, and then, you know, you uh, insert the corresponding details here. So that's quite straightforward. And then what you can do is two things. Now it depends a little bit how you want to use um, Neo4j and how to interact with it. So if you use the plain Java way with just the Java driver, then you can have your queries and you know get your results and then map your results. Or what I want to show you today, or this is more the approach I'm typically using, I'm also using this at, uh, in client projects, is to say, well, do we have um, an OGM way of mapping this? So that is basically the difference to um, what this uh, guide shows you is just the plain Java ways to say, okay, can we have this um, with the Java drivers and then how to use it and things like that. And we could access and inject the driver, what you see here. What we do, we use um, the new for j OGM way to say, okay, can we then um, also have the OGM on top of it? that uses, of course, internally the Java way. But what we do, that's why I include a different dependency here, is to use this dependency, Neo4j OGM Quarkus, that already ships with OGM here as well. So it includes the dependencies, which you can see here in the, uh, basically in these um, transitive dependencies. That's one thing. But also the second thing that's the nice story about this dependency, and you can get all of this code later, it also configures your session factory, your OGM session factory, so that it's actually injectable in your uh, code. Okay, how does this work? First of all, let's have a brief look at uh, the domain. And I think the easiest thing for that is to have a look at the Neo4j browser. So where does this come from? This is here, if you can read it, localhost. So that is my locally running instance. How am I running this? Well, uh, simple. I'm starting this up as a Docker container. So I've been uh, just running a local uh, Docker container of Neo4j and I'm um, already loading some data into it. So if we have a look, we have a few node labels here and especially some, well, coffee beans. So that's that. We have a few coffee beans. Now, what does this mean? Well. If you're a coffee nerd like myself, and if you go to a coffee shop, to the better coffee shops, you can usually, you know, ask for which type of beans do they have, where they come from, what they taste like, how they are roasted. And I came up with some names here. So this one, um, if we double click, as you probably know, in the browser here, we can show all of these relations. This is a note. That's a coffee bean. It has, well, as you can see, a name, you know, just a name. And then it also, here it says, well, tastes is from and taste. So we can have, uh, well, some relationships to, well, this is just a taste or a flavor. So there can be a floral taste, a fruity taste. And if you're into this coffee, there's something like a flavor wheel where you can uh, see things, um, what it tastes like. And then this taste, as you know, relationships can also have properties. They can have a certain percentage. So it tastes like, you know, 30% like floral and 70% like fruit. And by the way, it's from Colombia. And then, of course, in our model, we can have some other uh, beans that might taste like a fruit or might taste like something else, caramel taste, sweet taste, and things like that. And then you can come up you know, with this tasting landscape. 
Okay, so that's just very basic, our domain model that we say we have some coffee beans like the ones you can order in the shop and they have a certain properties that here are uh, represented by these relationships that they taste um, like a specific taste and they that they come from some country. Okay, how does this look like in our code? Let's first of all have a look at our domain entities. So that is a coffee bean. Now, what does this mean? This is now Java code, and that's a Java class, Coffee Bean, and of course, OGM. It is annotated with these OGM annotations at node entity. So this one is an entity. Okay, so an entity means, well, it has to have an ID, some sort of identifiable uh, property, which I use a UUID, so you can use um, that strategy um, that is supported by OGM and say, well, this should be a UUID or a string or a long or whatever makes sense for you. It has a name and then it has a bunch of relationships. So, well, it has an origin. Origin is basically a country. So it is from a specific um, origin. An origin is also a node entity where we just use this as a name. So where this comes from. And then it has a certain flavors. About the user rating, we'll talk in a second. So the flavor is basically, well, it tastes like, you know, fruit or something else. Now in Java, this works a little bit differently because in Java, our, well, relations, our references cannot have properties. So I need to have not just a flavor, but something like a flavor profile that is like an intermediate entity, which we can use as a relationship entity. So that is the tastes arrow, so to speak. And in this, we say, well, it has a start and an end node. So it goes from a coffee bean to a flavor. So a flavor can you know, just be a flavor with, with a name. But also it has a certain percentage. That is now the property of this relationship. So that is mapped in such a way. And also from a Java perspective, it makes absolute sense because we need this sort of entity in order to work with it. So that's that. And then we can say, well, you know, please use this. So already we have a coffee bean, a flavor profile, and a flavor. So these are the most important um, objects here or types here. Okay, then how to use them. Let's go from the bottom up. These are just the entities. What is sort of the service class or this uh, boundary um, in our use case, which is a class that is called coffee beans here. So this is application scope. That means it's also a bean, quote unquote, well, a Java bean, a bean of our Java Quarkus application. So that's a CDI bean, by the way. So a lot of beans today. Um, well, what does this mean? We use our session factory. I already what I was talking about this. You can, in fact, instantiate your se session factory yourself. CDI is very powerful. You can say I have a producer method and things like that. Luckily, we don't need that. What I said before, we have our OGM Quarkus dependency that auto configure this, uh, this for us. So just by using the properties, that's sufficient. We can say, okay, fine, this will be configured for us and we can just add inject it, which is what we're doing here. So that's all we need to do. We add inject this. And then let's go for a very uh, basic example. Let's say we would like to have all um, coffee beans, something like get coffee beans, all of them. We will have different uh, criteria that I will show you in the UI in a second. But the very basic thing is just open a session and then say something like load all. So load all of the coffee beans, sorted by name, you know, with uh, so and so many, so and so much depth. And that's it. And then they should be well returned. Okay, so where is this invoked? We have an invocation in our um, controller here and in, in our this should be some resource as well. Coffee beans resource. There we go. So we have let's start with this one. We have a rest controller. If you come from the spring world, it's very similar to a spring rest controller. This one is a JAX rest resource with this add path. That means under slash beans, we will have a JSON response of all of our coffee beans. Okay, that's quite interesting. Let's try this out. Um, my database is running already. My application now is running as well. And I can say, okay, curl localhost 8080 slash beans should give us a JSON response. Okay, fair enough. That's true. And we can already pretty print this and say, okay, interesting. What do we get here? Well, we get an array of coffee beans as JSON that have a name, an origin country that is now here serialized to JSON in a certain way. And we have certain flavor profiles. Okay, so that means we say, 
uh -huh, flavor profile, we have certain flavor with a certain percentage. So here you see it also makes sense to use this OGM way. Why? Because in our Quarkus application, out of the box, this works really nicely with our JSON approach. What do we use? We use a declarative JSON mapping, JSONB in our case, to just, well, return this, our coffee bean. And our coffee bean is just this, well, this class that will be mapped. We might annotate some more JSON stuff if we say, well, for example, just don't show the UUID, so that should be uh, J at JSONB transient, that works, and this will be included. Obviously, we could include our own data transfer object types if we need to. Um, here, we don't. We just say, okay, that's fine. That's a very good structure, and we use this as such. Okay. Now, as I said, I want to focus on the Neo4j side. So what does this mean? If we want to have um, now some more complex things or just some more different queries, let's say, okay, now give, give us the coffee beans in a specific flavor. Let's see, or let's say, I like um, fruity coffee. And it's actually true. I like fruity coffee or coffee with a floral or a berry taste. So especially coffee from Colombia, coffee from Ethiopia. These are some of my favorite origins. And if I say, okay, you have many, many hundreds of beans in stock, like just show me the ones that taste like a specific flavor. So what does this mean in our domain object? Well, obvious, a coffee bean that has a specific flavor. Now you might argue, well, a specific flavor in the majority, so more than so and so much percent, or just say a specific flavor in general, that it has some percentage of that flavor. Okay, if we think about it in our graph, that means, okay, now we take all of the nodes that have some relationship, at least this some tastes relationship with a specific flavor, with a specific other node. Well, now if you're a cipher expert, then you probably know what that translates to. So if I say, well, give us this for a specific flavor. So in our rest example, this might look like uh, beans uh, flavor, something like fruit where then we say, okay, now we only get two beans that match this particular flavor in some um, percentage. And in our code, that means, well, give us a specific flavor. So we already go to that method where we say, well, besides the only, well, type uh, querying, what we had before, we can also say, give us a specific query. Now, if you're on a recent Java version and can use text blocks, I definitely recommend to do so because this is really helpful here and say, well, match all of the coffee beans that taste like a specific flavor. Taste just, you know, regardless of how much, but just taste like a specific flavor with that name. Okay, so this would be sufficient. That line is to say, okay, match, and then return the coffee bean. Why do I have some other matches here? Well, that's quite interesting. Why do I have that? Because I need to map or to populate all of the other fields as well. And that's a cool thing about OGM. If we say we include all of the other properties that are sort of required to build up um, the coffee bean, then um, they should be returned here as well. So that is quite important is to say, okay, they um, need to be uh, returned here as well. So in case, let me now change something to show you this, that I could also, um, well, what happens if I don't include this here, then certain properties won't be included. What did I just do? I started up the Quarkus dev mode. If you're a Quarkus developer, you know about this and how probably you love this mode. This works really, really well, is to say, if I change something in my application, then um, I can see the changes quite quickly. So same story, I want to query for specific flavors. If I say, well, I forgot about these two um, subqueries and say, okay, forget it, just return the bean. Does this work? Well, kind of. It would work, but what is the difference? Well, now it only says name Elgato Loco and the flavor profiles and the origin are empty. Why? Well, because they're not returned, right? If you are very strict, well, this is just B, this is just my node, and that's it. None of, none of the other things. So here, if you specify that in your query, well, obviously you need to include this, is to say, okay, please return the other things as well. And that goes for all of these properties that you want to, uh, well, that you want to have. Good news is you don't need to set the properties in your Java classes. That will be done uh, and matched by OGM. So in the result list, well, you can check out the code uh, afterwards. This will just be added. So we already have a coffee bean and they will be populated. 
but at least they need to show up in the query. So if we change this here now, then it will return again. So this is also something that you need to take into consideration and that you need to test. Okay, that's that. Now let's see what um, else we need. Let's see a, a few more, you know, interesting examples, especially when it comes to recommendations, because this is then something where a graph database really shines because this is, well, you know, to be honest, it's quite nice that we can write such a query in a quite short way, because if you think about relational database, this already would be more, a um, little bit more complicated, but especially how we can do with some more recommendations. For that, I want to change a little bit in my example. I want to run now a different data set. So you can check this out on GitHub. I include some example data set that I just uh, was <laughs> scraping from some websites um, in order to get some examples here. So if I say, well, I would like to run my graph database in the Docker container as well. So let's uh, start this up one more time with a different uh, Cypher query. So I'm loading some data here. And how this works is as follows that I say, I have some example data. This is what I just showed you, which is um, here, which is not much. Basically, these four different beans. This is what I just had with some made up names that I invented. Or I say, well, I also have some data available in some big CSV that I load into here, which um, is, well, almost 100 uh, different beans. OK, now I restarted this real quick. And if I say, let me look at the browser again. Now I have many more coffee beans. And now I can see, OK, I have a lot of things here that all have a certain taste. Now this gets a little bit, uh, well, a little bit weird to have an overview, which is why I showed you the simple example first. But now what we can do is to say, OK, now I can just access this application, run this again. Now I think these flavors are called a little bit differently. Um, let's say they're called fruity because of the data set. And now we say, OK, we have many, many more coffee beans here. In fact, if I would count them, I think uh, length would be okay 65 fruity coffee beans so many more now to have a better overview i also include a ui in my quarkus application that's this one that's just you know a table of all of the coffee here and why am i showing you this well this is just you know a different view with all of the taste but now we say let's build something like um, a recommendation so let's say you go to your favorite coffee shops, you try some coffee, and then you say, okay, I really like this taste. Well, what is some other taste or other beans that I might like? So for that, I have a three-star rating system. So basically, when, once you try the coffee, it says, well, I really like it, I don't like it, or it's kind of like, yeah, it's fine, you know, like one to three stars. So assuming three stars means you that's your favorite, two, it's kind of like, yeah, it's drinkable, and one, it's yeah, not your cup of tea or cup of coffee. Okay, let's try this out. Let's say, okay, I like, well, I like a fruity coffee. Let's uh, vote for this. So I just you do use that. And now you see that is uh, now yellow. So I just voted for this. I like uh, this particular coffee. So you see, I take all the fruity ones. I might not take uh, this one. I'm not a big fan of earthy uh, coffee. And let's give this one a two star rating. OK, so I just were rated were rating some coffee. And now that's interesting. What we can have, we have um, can have some sorting. First of all, that's quite straightforward. Sort something by a name. Well, I think that's obvious in the query. You probably already have seen it. Let's have a look at this. We uh, can get uh, our coffee and say sort by um, just the name of the coffee bean. That's quite straightforward just to say, OK, get um, the coffee beans with the sort criteria of just a name, OK? Or we say, well, sort the coffee beans by a rating. Now, this is already um, a little bit, a little bit slightly more complicated, or at least we say, well, give the specific coffee beans, but also see where we have some rating. And the rating comes from a user. And now in my case, I only have one user. I only have my my user, like a single, single user here, but we have a sort of rating and the rater, a rating is again a relationship with a specific property that I think makes sense. So, you know, rating um, one, two, three. 
and that then is mapped as a relationship entity here as well. So with this, we say, well, okay, now let's have a rating. Now what we want to have, we want to have all of the beans with the typical properties so that it will be auto matched by the OGM. But also, well, with a specific rating, we want to return the rating as well, but also we want to then just, well, sort by the rating. Okay, in a specific way. So let's say I would like to sort by rating, which is the button up here. And then we say, well, these ones should come first and then everything that hasn't been rated. So that's basically a zero as a placeholder um, comes back then. Okay, so that's just a query with a sort. That's quite interesting. Okay. And the next thing is a recommendation. So with this, now we can have really something where it goes a little bit more into the data side of things. And especially where we can also think what makes sense for our domain and what makes sense from our graph perspective. Okay, so what is a recommendation? We say we tried some coffee before and we liked it. So it might say, well, what is the criteria now that you liked? You could say, well, I'm, you know, um, I'm a very uh, patriotic person. If you come from Latin America or from Africa, and I always drink the country of Colombia because I am from Colombia, and well, this might be one criteria, but it's more reasonable to assume that you actually like the flavor and that you like a specific flavor profile. So for example, I like fruity coffee. I like um, some floral taste and things like that. So you might get a recommendation that tastes similar. Now, what is the rating? The rating means you rated something basically good, bad, and so-so. And while you want to capture the criteria, what constitutes a good coffee? So all of the ratings where you say, well, good coffee, what do, in our case now, the flavor profiles look like? So which, well, not some, but basically vector, do they constitute? And can we find similar uh, coffee? Okay, so what does this mean here? I have now a little bit more complicated queries, and I will show you in a second how to dissect that also, where we say, well, what do we do? First of all, we say we want to get, well, what do we like to have? We would like to actually have not just the coffee beans, but the flavors that one likes. So based on the likings of a coffee beans, we say, what is your particular flavor profile that you really prefer? So we can give you something similar. Well, for that reason, we say, please match the flavor first. So now the flavor here and say, okay, now match all of the um, rated coffee beans that taste like the specific flavor. So say, well, get basically this sort of tuple and now say, get the rating where we say, well, everything um, where we say <laughs> this, um, this value minus two. So instead of one, two, three, you get um, negative zero or positive minus one, zero, plus one, because then plus one you can use as a factor to factor in that you liked something, not a bean now, but a flavor. And then also say, well, of course, get the percentage, how much that coffee bean tastes like a specific flavor. Why? Well, you need this um, because, you know, it's it might not be that strong of a fruity taste. Okay. And then you can calculate something that I did as a flavor weight. So how much do you like a specific flavor weight? Okay, wait a second. Let's do this uh, a little bit uh, slowly. How can we come up with some queries? Because that also wasn't just you know invented by myself in a second. I had to come up, uh, come up with this. And how can we debug these queries as well? What is really helpful, especially when we use these text blocks in Java, is the browser here in our database. Why? Because we can copy and paste these things into it and say, well, match the particular flavor and so on and so forth and say, okay, now we have to sort of flavor weight. So please just uh, return this. So we can have sub queries here and just copy and paste them and say, okay, this intermediate value that I calculate here, does this make sense? And can I uh, get this here? So I can have this of the flavor weights of saying, okay, now I get the flavor here and this particular weight that I now just calculated. So what did I do? I just took you know, the first part of the query and paste it into the browser and try it out basically and say, okay, I have a fruity flavor, winey flavor, chocolatey flavor. And here you see everything, basically all of the flavors that have been rated and you say, okay, was it a positive rating? Um, you know, neutral, which means um, basically one, uh, two stars or, you know, something uh, neutral or negative. 
So chocolatey, I said that was one star. So that's basically like bad. You didn't like this. And fruity, I also said this. This is very positive. So multiple times I actually voted for a fruity one, which comes in with a particular weight. So you might play with these values and see, okay, what does make sense from which criteria is in your domain model and then come up with that. Well, and then we can continue, right? So now we have the flavor weight. So now we can say, okay, match all of the coffee beans that taste like a particular flavor. And, you know, basically the same query like in the very beginning, but now also calculate a weight of the bean based on the flavor weight and how much that bean tastes like a, that flavor as well, you know, in the second run. So then we can have another weight and say, how much weight does this particular bean now have? And that is the criteria that we sort by, obviously. So that means if I go to the recommendation one, then we see, okay, kind of makes sense that the ones that we have a three-star rating show up here first, but also other ones that we haven't tried that taste fruity as well, fruity, flowery. And then we go into sort of the two-star area here, and then the region for one star, all of the other chocolatey, nutty earthy things that i don't like that much come basically last so this is then something where we say okay do we have a neutral rating a plus rating or a down rating based on these criteria so this is just one example and then again this one returns a bean so then we can take this and map map it into uh, neo4j ogm as well so this is something here so i have a few more minutes left i just want to show you some more um, interesting queries that also might go a little bit uh, differently. So if we go, if I click on this profile here, I can say, what is your individual profile for you as a user? And then we can see, okay, what are the rated coffee beans? Mm -hmm. How do we get this here in our Quarkers application? Well, easy. Let's see. We have a, that is called controller, user page controller. And we say, well, give us these three lists, basically. Rated coffee beans. What does that look like? Well, you probably guessed it, all of the beans that have been rated by a user, now it doesn't matter which rating, but of course we could order it by the rating and then a similar thing to before. So just return all of this data and then we get all of the beans that have been rated. So where this structure exists. Okay, so that's that. Get the recommended beans, that's uh, similar to um, before. Now with a caveat to say, here even it says in the comments, it doesn't contain rated beans. So something that you haven't tried before based on your preference. So these are coffee beans that you haven't uh, tried, but likely match um, what you tasted. How does this work? Well, you need to have something similar to before, but also now where not exists being rated by user. So where this structure doesn't exist, well, obviously because you shouldn't have rated it or shouldn't have tasted it before. So that's that. And this is what I really like about Cypher and using a graph database, uh, in particular Neo4j, where for these use cases, it really makes sense to write this in such queries. You know, if you look at that code, at first it might look overwhelming, but in comparison with a relational database or some other structures, this really, really makes sense. And this makes it so much easier. And if you look into it, you know, if you read it line by line, it's also you know comprehensible so you can uh, understand what's going on and say okay this is really this really makes sense from a code perspective okay so that's that we limited this to 10 so these are the 10 most likely tribal uh beans and then there's also something new flavor which basically means here untested coffee beans so something that hasn't been um, rated so beans with flavors that haven't been rated and where you say, well, it's neither positive nor negative. It might actually be a new taste that you haven't tried before. And for that, well, we go a little bit similar. We say, okay, now any rating would basically be downgraded where we say we do uh, the, well, the opposite sorting where we say, okay, get uh, all of the ratings and then say, well, any rating is now sort of, you know, not bad, but should be uh, rated, um, rated backwards. Um, from this weight perspective and then we say okay flavor weight now should be uh, this percentage and then match all of the coffee beans obviously something that we haven't tried that is then sorted um, by this weight okay so that's that and then we can come up with something that we actually haven't um, really think a nutty taste I didn't uh, rate before so something that we haven't kind of tried before so these are also different examples now in this coffee um sort of domain 
Okay, so what do we get out of here? Our Quarkus application has the support with um, Neo4j. This works very nicely. Mostly I use the JVM mode here for my Quarkus applications. That's a different or a longer story as to why, but this also here works um, if you want to go um, in a native mode. And um, in my case, I'm using Neo4j OGM. That works quite nicely if you use uh, the integration, especially with um, this Neo4j OGM Quarkus. And then I use Neo4j OGM, especially the session factory, to access um, all of the data here. In the same way, you can try it out how the data is written. What we have here with a vote for a specific um, bean or you know create a bean and things like that. So you, we run this in, in, trans uh, in transactions. And then we say here rate bean, for example. And then we say, okay, you know, what can we do here in order to save some particular um, entity and take it from there? So this is quite interesting, especially if we go the declarative mapping approach with Neo4j OGM, because this works really nicely in the enterprise uh, space, especially now what we have seen with Quarkus and then with the um, automatically available mapping to JSON and so on and so forth. So as always, um, for me, my code is available on GitHub. I hope this was interesting uh, to watch. So you can uh, check out the code, this favorite coffee uh, yourself. These are the links. You can also check out my blog um, that I have on the Neo4j uh, sort of topic. So I have some attacks available there, which I can show you just real quick. Especially I've been um, producing some YouTube videos that show how to use this with Neo4j. Also how to run a Neo4j database in the cloud, in your Kubernetes cluster, and as well as uh, with Neo4j Aura. So you can try uh, this out. And um, also on this topic of Quarkus, I'm offering some on-demand uh, workshops and some courses that you can join. The next one will be in December. So if you're interested in Quarkus in general, then this might be something for interest for you as well. And just in general, I hope you enjoyed this live demo uh, session. And if you are curious, you can try out the code or uh, learn more here. And with that, yes, thank you very much. Um, thank you very much for your attention.